Friends, the Lord be with you as we gather to worship today. It's a gift to be together in this way as we gather around God's word and his table as we sing and pray and remember the good news of God's grace together. So as we continue in worship, let's sing All Creatures of Our God and King. of our God and King, lift up your voice and with us sing, Alleluia, Alleluia, O burning sun with golden beam, and shining moon with silver that sail in heaven alone. Alleluia, alleluia. Who rising dawn in praise rejoice. You lights of evening find a voice. Oh, praise Him. Oh, Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Friends, hear these words from Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, and who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. Each week when we gather to worship, we gather around prayers of confession for the reason the psalmist lists all these benefits of God, healing, forgiveness, redemption, a reminder week after week, time after time, that, that God calls out to us, just like in Genesis, in the garden, where are you? Where are we in life or faith? What are the things that need to be healed, forgiven? Where are our longings and desires not quite matching up to what God has for us? And so we gather around prayers of confession. And today we're going to sing our prayer today uh, through new music set to the words of Psalm 51. So for these next few moments, let's pray together. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy according to your love. Wash me fully and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse my heart within. Let's sing that again. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy according to your love. Wash me fully and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse my heart within. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry too real to hide and too deep to undo. So forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change and open to us a future in which we can be changed. And grant us grace to grow more and more your likeness and image through Jesus Christ the light of the world let's sing wash me wash me whiter than the snow I shall be that again. Wash me. Wash me whiter than the snow. I shall be clean. Fill me with your joy and gladness. I shall rejoice. God of our salvation. Oh God of our salvation, we sing aloud your praises. Open, Lord, our lips and our alleluia's ring. Oh Jesus, you have brought us 
hear these words of assurance. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor does he keep a record of wrongs. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Let's sing Alleluia. We sing Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, these benefits of God that the psalmist proclaims, healing, forgiveness, redemption, are ours as a free gift in Jesus Christ by his life, death, and resurrection. And so we have the opportunity to respond to that grace with all of our lives to seek the ways of peace that Christ brings to the world. And so as you pay attention to how that plays out in your own lives, we also want to pay attention to it at Pillar. So there's a lot of ways to connect and serve together. We hope that you'll stay tuned to our weekly newsletter and our website, PillarChurch.com. That's the best way to know what's happening here week to week. Uh, There's also a give link on our website, PillarChurch.com, to support the mission and ministry of Pillar financially. And a couple things we want to specifically make you aware of for the coming weeks. There's going to be a baby blessing on January 22 at 3 p.m. here at Pillar. This is for a a time to celebrate all the families and mothers and babies who were born in 2022. And for the rest of the women in the Pillar community, you're open and invited to participate in this event Uh, as we celebrate these uh, gifts of God together. And then also on the 22nd, uh, right after the second service, we're going to have our next college lunch. So if you are a college student among us, we hope that you can join us for a meal uh, after the service on the 22nd. And then finally, uh, we'll have our third of three men's gatherings uh, on the 23rd, That's Monday evening at 5.30. We'll meet in the gathering space. And once again, our friend Trigvi Johnson will be leading us in conversation with the beautifully titled, My Life is Better Than Your Vacation. So if you're a man, or if you are a man around Pillar, uh, join us on the 23rd uh, for our men's gathering. But for now, we gather around God's word. God's word that shows us the way of Jesus, the way we ought to live. And so as we prepare to hear God's word today, let's sing again, We Long to See You. Almighty God. We long to see you open our hearts and make them pure. Spirit, we wash our hands in mercy. Come teach our souls to love. Sing that again, Almighty God. Almighty God, we long 
our souls to love your truth. The Lord be with you. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Pillar. I would so love to see you wherever you are. Maybe you're able to frequent this place with some regularity in person, but for whatever reason this weekend didn't work out, or maybe you're in Idaho, or maybe you're in Wisconsin, or maybe New Hampshire, or Taiwan, or Germany. I so wish I could see you. It'd be, if you're really bored this week and you'd be willing to just shoot me an email, john at pillarchurch.com, just say hi and where you are. That would thrill my spirit. For now, holiday excesses, the eating and the drinking and the gatherings of people, gave way to New Year's determinations, the exercise and the diet and the practice that promises full health, have now turned to what the church has called for a long time, ordinary time. It's just January ordinary time. You drive to work in the dark, you come home at the end of the day in the dark, ordinary time. The leaves are long gone, the buds are nowhere to be found, it's just ordinary time. Now, when people ask you about the holidays, you tell them about New Year's Eve, maybe Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, or New Year's Day, but you don't tell them about Wednesday, Thursday, it's just ordinary time. Uh, for the sermon's purpose during ordinary time, which leads us up to the season of Lent, which starts February 22nd, I'm calling it in those days. Those days. Nothing remarkable. Nothing to be seen here. Nothing fancy about those days. It's just those days. The bulk of life happens in those days. I'm borrowing from Matthew's gospel the story you're about to hear, so let's just get after it. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair. With a leather belt around his waist, as food he ate locusts and wild honey. The people of Jerusalem and all Judea were coming out to him and all the region along the Jordan to be baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. When he saw the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to him to be baptized, he said, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we're children of Abraham. For God can turn even these stones into children of Abraham. Even now, the axe lies at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. There is one coming after me more powerful than I. I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. The winnowing fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the granary and the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented saying, I need to be baptized by you, but do you come to me? Jesus answered, let it be so for now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness, and he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, as he came up out of the waters, the heavens were opened for him, and the Spirit of God descending 
He saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and alighting on him, and he heard a voice from heaven say, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. Then the tempter came and said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus said, As it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple and said, throw yourself down, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will, they will bear you up with their hands so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus said, as it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took him to a great high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor and said, all this I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan. As it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And the devil left him. And the angels came and waited on him. When Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home at Capernaum by the sea in the land of Zebulun and Naphtali in order to fulfill what had been spoken by the prophet Isaiah, land of Naphtali and Zebulun on the road by the sea Galilee of the Gentiles, those who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. For those who sat in the region and shadow of death, on them light has dawned. And then Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's Matthew chapter 3 through chapter 4, verse 17. If you wanted to find it in a Bible near you or with you, it's the baptism turned temptation narrative. I'm calling it the baptation or the temptism. We've zoomed out just a little bit. Maybe you've heard the baptism and temptation story before. We're zooming out now just a little bit to what precedes it and what follows it to give a little flavor to it all. The baptism story with that crescendoing announcement, this is my son, the beloved with whom I'm well pleased, and people hug, and Mary and Joseph embrace, and there's brunch afterwards. Everybody's so happy, but not John, not the Baptist. He doesn't seem pleased at all. John sees those Pharisees and Sadducees and says, you dogs, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? What happened to brunch? John starts talking about wrath, and Jesus shows up. John starts talking about wrath, and love shows up. John starts talking about wrath, and the beloved one shows up. John talks about the axe at the root of the trees. Every tree that doesn't bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John talks about the winnowing fork in his hand to clear the threshing floor, and Jesus shows up. Love shows up. The beloved one shows up with the winnowing fork in his hand. We have a tendency to domesticate the gospel. We put it in a kennel and walk it with a leash. We tend to treat Jesus like a doll. If we could rub his belly, maybe all of our dreams would come true. And John shows up, and John starts warning. John starts cautioning. John starts talking about the axe and the wrath and the winnowing fork, and Jesus then shows up, the embodiment of John's caution, the embodiment of John's warning. Jesus shows up, love shows up, the beloved one shows up. This is why the poet would say, this child is a signal for war. This is why the, the, the psalmist would pray centuries before this day, 
Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel against the Lord. I've set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decrees of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. With the world swirling in political chaos and oppression and abuse, the psalmist prays, this is my son. And now here, Jesus, in the waters of baptism, you are my son. This child is a signal for war. And John the Baptist wants us to see. John the Baptist saw it before we did. John the Baptist warns. John the Baptist cautions. And Jesus shows up. Love shows up. The beloved one shows up, announcing, repent. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Uh, John says it first. John says, John shows up in the Judean wilderness. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And then Jesus echoes after the waters drip dry from his long hair. And he's relieved from the temptation, the wilderness temptation. Jesus echoes, John, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus shows up and starts talking about the kingdom. If you're taking notes, you can write that down, the kingdom. The kingdom where mercy rules and grace reigns, the kingdom. Where justice happens and reconciliation takes place, the kingdom. Where the hurts are healed and the lost are found, the kingdom. Like Isaiah imagined, the lion and the lamb will lie down together and there'll be peace on earth, the kingdom. Like St. John saw people from every language and tribe and nation all gathered around the throne, the kingdom. One of the things we have to contend with in our own lives is our tendency to reduce life to what we can manage and control, what's observable. Life is only what can be measured, we seem to think, especially in ordinary time. In those days, it's just the tick of the clock. The sun has already set by the time you're home from work. Spring break's just a pipe dream. It's just those days, and we can tend to reduce life to what we can see and taste and touch and feel All the while, there's so much more. The kingdom, grace is not out of reach. Forgiveness can happen. The kingdom, reconciliation can be the way and peace can be achieved. The kingdom. Jesus shows up. Repent for the kingdom has come near. I was in a conversation this past week with Justin and Melissa Klingenberg. They're old friends of mine, the kind of friends that your, your lives have been so overlapped, so braided together, you don't really know when you became friends, kind of friends. Uh, they have three kids, Finley's five, Antonio's three, and Shepard is just a couple of months old. Uh, Shepard was born with a heart condition, not, not, not like you may have heard in some cases where a child is born with a little hole in their heart. This is quite a bit more significant than that. Uh, Shepard will be baptized here at Pillar in a couple of weeks, and then shortly after he'll go into surgery, so we'll celebrate with them at baptism, and then we'll absolutely be praying for them as they walk that road of surgery and recovery. Uh, We were together this past week talking about baptism and Little Shepherd, and um, Justin, kind of a lay theologian, started asking me some big questions about God and faith and heaven and eternity and hell. And my, my disposition uh, in the presence of such significant questions is to be slow to answer, but rather pursue the passion and the story behind the question. So Justin's asking me these big questions, and I'm trying not to answer. How do you suppose that went? And we we find our, found ourselves meandering in conversation towards two categories called bounded sets and centered sets. Two categories that may not mean much to you, but the history of the church has sort of surrounded themselves in those categories, bounded sets and centered sets. Bounded sets is basically, think of a big fence. There's this big boundary line that's been placed, and you're either in or you're out, and you know when you're in and you know who's out. Centered sets would be a little bit like walking days on end through the long, hot, dry desert, and someone says, water, water. And the people come running, water, water's good, water refreshes, it cleanses, it purifies, it sustains. Bounded sets and centered sets don't have to be mutually exclusive, but Jesus shows up, starts talking about a centered set, the kingdom, where grace reigns and mercy rules, the kingdom. It's so good over here, the kingdom. 
Uh, I like this from uh, Frederick Buechner in a book titled Listening to Your Life. It's a devotion I do each morning. A crazy holy grace, I've called it. Crazy because whoever could have predicted it? Who can ever foresee the crazy how and when and where of a grace that wells up out of the lostness and pain of the world and of our own inner worlds? And holy because these moments of grace come ultimately from farther away than Oz and deeper down than doom. Holy because they heal and hallow. Faith is like the dream in which the clouds open to show such riches ready to drop upon us that when we wake into the reality of nothing more than common sense, we cry to dream again because the dreaming seems truer than the waking does to the fullness of reality, not as we've seen it to be sure, but as by faith we trust it to be without seeing. Faith is both the dreaming and the crying. Faith is the assurance that the best and holiest dream is true after all. The kingdom holy and crazy. It's true after all, wild and free, the kingdom where the lost is found and the hurting is healed, the kingdom where grace rules and mercy reigns, the kingdom where justice can be pursued and peace can be realized, the kingdom. Don't reduce your life to what you can manage and control, manipulate and navigate. There's so much more, the kingdom. Jesus shows up announcing, repent for the kingdom. Come on in, enter in. That's what I think, I think, I think that's what he means by repent. If you're still taking notes, that's the second little point, repent. We use the word repentance, it's like a blaming word, it's a pointing the finger kind of word, it, it's an indictment word, repent. You are bad, you are wrong, you did something awful and you need to change course. And of course it can include that in cases, but I think at least in this case, repent is less about what's wrong and what's bad and more about what's right and what's good. Repent for the kingdom has come near. It's a little bit like when you've got your GPS thing on your phone and you're driving to a place you don't know how to get to and you make a wrong turn and it says recalculating. Repent. Get back on course. Repent. The kingdom's over here. Change. Turn around. The kingdom. Repent, change. That's why John the Baptist gets so upset at those Pharisees and the Sadducees when they show up. They're rule-abiding, law-following, they're pious kind of people. It's not that they've been doing anything awful. It's just that by their rules and by their laws, they've been keeping other people away from the true and the good and the beautiful. And John says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Come on, join in. It's over here. Water. A little confession since we're talking about repentance. Uh, Kristen and I love to look at houses. Some people scroll social media. We love to look at realtor.com. I'll come home from church at the end of the day and she'll say, hey, check out this one. Or laying in bed late at night, ooh, look at this. And and we're not really thinking about moving. We just love to look at houses. I suppose in the back of our minds, if the perfect place came up, we might consider it. But mostly, we just like to look. And every once in a while, there's one we think is so cool, we just want to go check it out. We want to go see someone else's house. So we'll drive over to the open house and we'll walk through the beautiful kitchens and the wonderful basements. We'll in through their bedrooms with their closets full of stuff. It's sort of awkward. And you you do that long enough, and soon enough, you start to imagine yourself there. Oh, Tabby would love this room. Oh, Ava would love that. Look at this property. And if you go down that road far enough, you start to think about, what would I need to do to sell my house? What would would have to happen if my house were to sell? Uh, Most of us, most of the time, keep our homes pretty well kept. You know, you put the dishes away most of the time. You vacuum every couple of months, maybe. Maybe. And then when you, have, when you have guests over, maybe you ratchet it up just a little bit, you, you, you clean the bathrooms and you light candles to cover the smell of the wet dog, and then every maybe once, maybe twice a year, you do the deep clean, the spring clean, when you wash the windows and you, you pull out of the basement all the stuff you're going to sell at the garage sale for a dime, 
And then, and then it's ratcheted up even higher when you think about selling your house. If you're going to sell your house, the rotting wooden window frame in your Michigan cellar basement should probably be addressed. The, the drip from the pipe that's leaking just a little, you should probably take care of that. The bucket's not going to do it anymore. The, the latch on your outside fence that doesn't quite work, you should probably tend to that. If you're going to sell your house, you're, you're looking at it in such a different view. Jesus shows up and says, repent, for the kingdom has come near. Repent, change. He's not asking us to put the dishes away as a normal practice. He's not even invite, suggesting a few guests might stop by. He's not only saying a deep spring cleaning. He's suggesting you got to sell the house. you got to get it ready to be sold, sold out for the kingdom. The window frame in the basement needs to be addressed, and the leaky pipe and the latch on the fence, it all needs to be taken care of to be sold out for the kingdom of God. Repent. And your home is so much better, and your neighborhood is in such better shape. Repent, for the kingdom has come near. Near, that's, if you're still taking notes, the th- the third little focus of this sermon, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, near. The proximity of the kingdom has to do with the presence of Christ. Christ, The heavens open, Christ comes up out of the waters, and in his living and in his dying and in his rising, the kingdom's made available, no longer out of reach but close. No longer somewhere out there, but now here among us, the kingdom has come near. That's the way of Christ. The difference between John's announcement, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and Jesus' echo, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near, is Jesus going down into the waters of baptism and out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus is the difference. Jesus is the fulcrum. Jesus is the hinge. Jesus is the one. Jesus, born of the virgin mother and the unsuspecting father to become like us, down into the waters of baptism to identify with us, out into the wilderness to know exactly what you experience every day. He's the only one who suffered and died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, who went down to the grave to defeat sin and death and rose up in resurrection so that you might have life and have it to the full and sends the spirit to be with us still, to be among us now, to be here, the kingdom. It's not out of reach, the kingdom. You can participate, the kingdom. And the way of the kingdom is the way of Christ. John warns. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? John starts talking about an ax and a winnowing fork and an unquenchable fire, and Jesus shows up. Love shows up. The beloved one shows up, not to remove the caution or the warning, but to suggest the way of this war is the way of Christ. To win this battle is not to fight in terms of the cultural weapons, but rather to participate in the way of the kingdom. You want to go to war? Love. You want to go to war? Forgive. You want to go to, the, go to war? Pursue justice. You want to go to war? Pursue reconciliation. You want to go to war? Pursue peace. You want to go to war? Be gentle. You want to go to war? Be kind. You want to go to war? Be patient. You want to go to war? Self-control. Wasn't Martin Luther King the one who said, hate doesn't drive out hate, only love does that? You want to go to war? The kingdom. The kingdom available now, the kingdom here now, Christ inaugurates and initiates the kingdom, makes it available to you here today, us now. So it's ordinary time. That's what they call it in the church. Just Tuesday becomes Wednesday. The leaves are long gone. The buds are only a dream. Spring break is a long way off. The holidays are over. It's dark when you go to work. It's dark when you get back. It's just Thursday. It's so easy to reduce our lives to the mundane and the menial. All the while, there's so much more. The kingdom. Change course. Lean in. Enter. Participate. Repent. 
for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I'll give Henry now on the last word and then we'll come to the table. Christian leaders, and I don't think he'd mind if I simply said Christians, cannot simply be persons who have well-informed opinions about the burning issues of our time. Their leadership, their presence, must be rooted in the permanent, intimate relationship with the incarnate word Jesus, and they need to find there the source for their words, advice, and guidance life. Dealing with burning issues without being rooted in a deep personal relationship with God easily leads to divisiveness because, before we know it, our sense of self is caught up in our opinion about a given subject. But when we are securely rooted in personal intimacy with the source of life, it will be possible to remain flexible without being relativistic, convinced without being rigid, Willing to confront without being offensive, gentle and forgiving without being soft, and true witnesses without being manipulative. The kingdom. Because Christ, the kingdom, Christ came, the kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom has come near. Amen? In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's near, it's here. It's close. Come. Come to the table. Eat. Drink. It's so good. It's so much better. If you believe Jesus is Lord and acknowledge him as Savior, you're welcome here at this table or whatever you've got set up for yourselves, water, uh, wine, and, and bread, maybe crackers and juice. If you're not at that place, if you wouldn't count yourself a Christian, this isn't meant to be manipulative. I'm just so grateful that you would bear with us this long. And I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to meet you. Feel free to email me, john at pillarchurch.com. Maybe we could have a cup of coffee, maybe take a walk. Uh, For those who do participate, come, for all things are ready.
Every vow we've broken and betrayed, you are the faithful one, and from the God into the grave, bind us to. you are about to enter every sector of public life to claim it for Christ. So as you do, may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Go in peace.